Ever wonder if your annual checkup is catching all of the right things? What if you're missing a crucial blood test that could have easily prevented a serious health issue like a heart attack? In this video, I'll show you five life-saving blood tests that everyone should get, plus another four that certain groups of people should also consider. And if one of these tests reveals something concerning, don't worry, I'll guide you through the next steps to protect your health. Plus, I'll explore whether specific blood tests can help with early cancer detection and what you need to know about them. Let's dive in. Starting with a test that's often overlooked by family health doctors, yet is recommended by the European Atherosclerosis Society. It's called lipoprotein little a. Lipoproteins are like the trucks that carry cholesterol around your body, and just like how some trucks carry dangerous cargo, high levels of lipoprotein little a are a major risk factor for heart disease, aortic valve problems, and even death. This risk doesn't discriminate. It affects men, women, and people of all ethnicities. What's tricky about lipoprotein little a is that it's mostly determined by our genes. Unlike other lipoproteins, diet and exercise, they don't have that much effect on lipoprotein little a levels. That's why the European Atherosclerosis Society suggests that everyone should get tested at least once in their adult life. And if your lipoprotein little a levels are high, it's a red flag that we need to double down on controlling all of the other heart attack risk factors. That means paying extra attention to our diet, exercise, blood pressure, and avoiding smoking and alcohol. Managing stress is crucial too. Think of it as reinforcing all of the walls if one is already showing cracks. So what is a good lipoprotein little a result? Well, the European Atherosclerosis Society suggests that ideally we'd want to have a level below 30 milligrams per deciliter or less than 75 nanomoles per liter. The good news is that about 75% of us will be below that number. But if we're above the ideal range, it means again we need to be more aggressive with treating our other heart attack risk factors. Which leads us onto the second of five life-saving blood tests, a lipid or cholesterol panel. The key here though is the interpretation of the results. A standard panel includes total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. Now there's a lot of confusion online about blood cholesterol levels, so let's tidy that up a bit. First of all, cholesterol is essential for life and we cannot live without it. It helps to make our cell membranes, hormones like testosterone and bile for digesting fats. No cholesterol means no life. The good news is that we've known for decades that all cells in the body can produce their own cholesterol. Now, the liver and other organs can make extra cholesterol and send it out if other cells need it, kind of like an emergency delivery service. And primarily, the cholesterol is transported in vehicles called lipoproteins, which we've already mentioned before. That's what we're measuring on these cholesterol blood tests. Since we're only measuring the cholesterol levels in the blood, we're only measuring a tiny fraction of the body's total cholesterol content. But when there's too much LDL cholesterol in the blood, it can get dumped into your artery walls, like trash piling up on a highway, eventually leading to blockages that cause heart attacks and strokes. Now a few things to note here. Some people suggest paying for additional tests, like oxidized LDL or small dense LDL, claiming that these are the true culprits. But that's missing the point. What we're really looking at is the vehicles, the lipoproteins that carry cholesterol. The ones that carry an ApoB tag, they are the troublemakers, including the small dense LDL and oxidized LDL particles. These particles cross from the bloodstream into the blood vessels, and if there's a high enough concentration, they become trapped in the artery wall. So if you're looking for a more precise test, consider an ApoB test, but be aware that generally doubles the cost, which is why most guidelines stick with measuring LDL cholesterol. The next thing that comes up online is what evidence do we actually have that lowering LDL cholesterol and ApoB reduces heart attacks? Well, meta-analyses such as this one that combine all of the data together, including from genetic studies and randomized controlled trials from over 20 million person years of follow-up, conclusively proves that high levels of LDL causes heart disease. Now, experts on YouTube who unfortunately don't follow the clinical guidelines will argue that ApoB and LDL cholesterol is not the issue. It's insulin resistance, obesity, smoking, a sedentary lifestyle, blood pressure that truly cause heart disease. And if those risk factors are optimized, then we don't need to worry about blood cholesterol. Well, the PISA study answers those experts. This study found that even in people with perfect risk factors, so no obesity, they didn't smoke, no high blood pressure, the blockages still form in the blood vessels if the LDL cholesterol levels rise. It was only when LDL cholesterol was below 60 milligrams per deciliter that no blockages in the blood vessels were seen. 
Another study published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology this year in 2024 again shows that for people without other heart disease risk factors, if LDL cholesterol and APRO B increase, so too does the extent of blockages in our blood vessels. There's even a suggestion now in the literature that the optimal LDL cholesterol level appears to be the level that was present at birth, which is around 20 to 40 milligrams per deciliter. The final point is that some people worry that lowering cholesterol too much could be harmful. As explained though, all cells in our body can produce their own cholesterol, and the blood levels that we measure, they only represent a tiny fraction of the body's total cholesterol content. Studies show that even when LDL is below 40 milligrams per deciliter, there are no concerning side effects. The brain, by the way, makes its own cholesterol and doesn't rely on what's in the blood. So what ranges are we looking for? That will depend on our risk factors, but as a broad oversimplification, if we've already had a heart attack or a stroke, the goal is to bring down our LDL cholesterol and APOB as low as possible via a combination of diet, exercise, and cholesterol-lowering therapies such as statins, azetamibe, and PCSK9 inhibitors. Now, statins get a bad rap for their side effects, so let's explore that briefly. Statins cause muscle aches in about 1-2% to of people, but the risk is low for low-dose statin therapies, which is what I prescribe for my patients. We get most of the benefits from low-dose statins, rather than continuing to increase the dose. Statins are not associated with cognitive impairment, nor do they affect testosterone levels. But if there are no heart disease risk factors, such as high blood pressure or diabetes or a family history, then a reasonable target is to get the LDL cholesterol below 70. Now personally, I want to target a lower level. I want to get mine below 60, but that's my own personal choice because I want to do everything that I can to prevent a heart attack or a stroke when I'm 70 or 80 years old. So I take Rosuvastatin 5 milligrams to help bring my levels down in addition to a great diet and exercise. Now speaking of diabetes, the third blood test that we absolutely need to get is an HbA1c. The HbA1c test reveals your average blood sugar levels over the the past two to three months. It's like checking the weather pattern instead of just looking at today's temperature. Now, you may see online people recommending to get insulin blood tests or for non-diabetic patients to pay for continuous glucose monitors. Now, it's your money, your call, but as a screening test for what primary care physicians such as myself are interested in for preventative care, those tests don't change clinical practice. Instead, if I discover that a patient is pre-diabetic from the HbA1c level, we need to really step up our game. We have to have a diet that's rich in non-starchy vegetables, legumes, nuts, whole fruits and whole grains. High, lean protein foods such as fish and chicken also help. We also want to avoid sugary, processed foods fruit drinks, and junk food. Studies even suggest that prescribing metformin to pre-diabetics can help reduce the risk of developing full-blown type 2 diabetes. Psyllium husk and GLP-1 medications like Ozempic are also other options to consider. The fourth test is kidney function, specifically sodium, potassium, and creatinine. Your kidneys are the body's filters, and these tests are like the dashboard lights in your car. They give you an early warning if something is wrong. If a problem is detected, it's essential to follow up with your doctor immediately. It's the same for the fifth test, a full blood count. A full blood count checks your red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. It's a basic test, but it can reveal issues like anemia, infection, or other hidden issues. If anything is off here, that prompts us primary care physicians to jump into action and to figure out if there are any under underlying issues. In terms of tests that everyone should get, that's it. There are four other tests that specific groups of people should consider getting, and I'll discuss those shortly. But for the five tests that everyone should get, so long as no issues were revealed when first tested, I encourage my 18 to 35 year old patients to have their levels checked every two to three years, and my patients over 35 to have their levels checked yearly. But you might be wondering, if money was no object and testing is so important, why not just test everyone for everything all of the time? And I need to answer this question first before explaining the four extra specific tests that some people should get. Now, here's the thing. No test is perfect. They all have what's called false positives and false negatives. So imagine running a test for a rare condition that affects 1 in 10,000 people, but this test has a false positive rate of 1 in 1,000. So for every 10 positive results, 9 would be incorrect. Now that's not very helpful, is it? 
That's why doctors focus on a thing called pre-test probability. We don't just order tests at random. We use our experience and training, as well as the medical history and examination, to narrow down which tests are necessary. This approach helps avoid unnecessary worry and potential harm from those unnecessary tests. Instead, here are four additional tests that certain people should get. The first is liver function. For example, as I mentioned, I'm on a statin, so I get my liver function tested once a year. Other people who need their liver tested are people who drink alcohol, are overweight, on other medications, etc. But for otherwise healthy people who are not on other medications, the guidelines do not suggest routinely checking liver function because there's no added benefit. The guidelines are written in such a way to only recommend something if there's good evidence of benefit. There's an engineering idea that may help explain this concept. The best part is no part. The best process is no process. It's important to understand that the clinical guidelines are not about limiting people unnecessarily. They're about preventing us from chasing numbers that don't translate into better health outcomes. The guidelines take the approach that we should focus on what we know works rather than over-medicating just because we can. The second test is thyroid function. Now the approach here is very similar to liver function testing. The guidelines suggest testing thyroid function if there's a clinical reason to do so, such as symptoms of fatigue, hair thinning, or weight gain. But for otherwise healthy people with no symptoms, there's no added benefit, which is why the guidelines do not recommend routine screening. Once again, it's your money, your health, your decision. So you can, of course, test your thyroid, but it's not part of the preventative care clinical guidelines. The third test are micronutrient tests, such as testing your vitamin D. Now, for people who have a medical condition, like inflammatory bowel disease or celiac disease, they may need testing for specific vitamins and minerals to make sure they're absorbing enough. But for otherwise healthy people who eat a good diet and are taking a low-dose multivitamin and mineral supplement, there's no advantage. Again, the best process is no process. And I recently did an in-depth video about vitamin D testing, which you can check out here. The fourth test to consider is cancer screening. Now, men can use the PSA test as a screening tool for prostate cancer. But currently, that's the only blood test with enough evidence to be recommended by the clinical guidelines. There's the Gallery blood test for cancer screening that's being actively researched, which is a catch-all test for cancers. But currently, there's not enough evidence that this test will save lives or improve survival times for cancer. So I'm crossing my fingers that that research will come out shortly and it's positive. But until then, the clinical guidelines don't recommend it. The idea of not testing for everything may seem a bit strange if you've not had the clinical guidelines explained to you, and I highly recommend you check out the next video here on vitamin D supplements and blood tests. The Endocrine Society just released an important update regarding vitamin D, and it gives a thorough explanation as to why we don't test everyone's vitamin D levels, and a massive thank you to all of the Patreons supporting the channel.